since it's Father's Day, you may be wondering uh, what passage are we going to be on today. We will be in Philippians chapter 2 and verse uh, 19 through 24, which is the exact verse that comes after what we were preaching on last week as we uh, are continuing verse by verse through Philippians. So I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if this is going to be the kind of Father's Day uh, message that we would would want. Um, I, I think I think you'll be encouraged by the time we finish. But I uh, will just tell you that no, nowhere in this uh, series of verses are you going to find uh, anybody's favorite verse. Um, this is not one of those. It's not a place where uh, you probably would expect um, for us to talk about um, and inc- try to encourage fathers. It, it's honestly we want to encourage everybody that's here today. Um, but let me, let me just encourage those of you that are here for the first time that what we have been doing is we've been talking about pressing forward in our faith and what that looks like. And there's a number of things that have become very obvious over the course of this year as we've des- described that. And one of those things is that uh, you, you don't just accidentally wake up one day um, as a fully grown believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, generally, like anything else in life, there takes some intentionality and it takes habits and routines that practiced over long periods of time uh, in some ways to the degree that the intensity is there and the length of time as well. You see growth. You're like, well, wait a minute. You're saying that salvation's about works. No, I'm saying salvation's completely about Jesus Christ and his work in you. Um, in fact, we just this past week looked at how he does the work in you to change your desires, and then he does the work Uh, of the actual doing of making the actions different. Like he spawns all of that within you uh, and empowers all of that. However, however, the, the, the consistency over time, what we've learned is if we don't have a plan and if we don't have some intentionality, we tend to not ever take the steps with any consistency to get to where we need to get to. Does that make sense? And so we've learned that that matters. We see that in, in the text. We see, um, ha- have seen it along the way. And I want to continue that thread as we continue to look at Philippians. Um, and really, we're going to go, I feel like I could preach the entire Bible, really. Uh, and certainly, Um, every part of Philippians because all the pieces are connected. I'm not sure if that makes a ton of sense to you, but he continues with a a context that we were looking at last week. If you weren't here last week, let me real quickly just remind you that um, the whole idea was that we're to live lives uh, as believers in Jesus Christ that literally are a contrast to all the world around us. Um, The good news to that is that it's become a lot easier if you live an authentic Christian life well, it's become, in theory, it's become a lot easier to tell the difference between one that is and one that isn't um, in the world that we're living in. And so in light of that, you'd ask the question, well, what is it that we're, we're going to dig into today? Well, there's, a, there's actually, I'm going to give you a, t- some literary background if I can. You, I don't know if y'all want liter- literary background. You just want to beat the other people to the restaurant, right? <laughs> Anybody going to lunch today? Um, I won't keep you late, but let me just tell you this. Uh, they call, at the end of each of these letters in the New Testament, if you're not familiar with the New Testament, there's a lot of smaller books uh, in the back part of the Bible they call the New Testament, and those were letters that were written early on, and generally they have something in them called a travel log. Uh, honestly, when I was in seminary and studying each one of these, the beginning um, of each of these letters and the end of it were never my favorite parts. They were always dull and boring. They were always, always full of names that I didn't want to pronounce, and then when I did, I didn't get them right, and seemingly meaningless details, but they're not meaningless, right? But they call it the end, like they'd had no place to give this information. Like these days you have email, phone calls, right, FaceTime, all the stuff you can give information. A snail mail kind of letter is not where you're going to provide tremendous amounts of information. These people didn't interact except when they sent somebody with a message to another person that they'd written down. And so included in it is, hey, how are you guys doing? And I can't wait to hear how y'all are doing. And here's, here's how we're doing. And here's who's with me. And here's on this journey that we're on, this missionary journey. We're going to go here, and then we're going to go here. And we'd like, maybe in, the, maybe in the fall, maybe a little bit later, we're not really sure when, depending on how things go, we'll be here and here and there. And so they had to kind of talk about, like, and if they had something they wanted to pray, wanted them to pray for, they had to put that in there as well. So you see all that in there at the beginning and at the end. And then usually there's that thing they call the travel log. It's usually at the end. It's right smack dab in the middle. You'd say, well, why in the world would something like that be in the middle? In this one, the reality is that the Apostle Paul gets to a place where he's talking about what it means to live as a light in a dark place for Jesus Christ. He's given them a picture of what that should look like, which is Jesus Christ. But now he's fixing to give them a concrete example in a person that they would have known and understood, like they would have related to. 
And it's almost as though right in the middle of it, before he got to the end to do the travel log, he had like, it's almost like he had ADD. And I'm like, yes, maybe Paul did too, right? Uh, you know, I can relate to him a little better now. And so he, he began to, to, to talk about his love for Timothy. Now, so in the middle of this, I want, I want to share the text with you, and then we'll, then we'll kind of unpack it. It's not a long text. And I, I'm not promising you I'm going to get you out early, but I actually have, I will tell you, that, cross, that thought crossed my mind over here. And even though I'm kind of making this, this intro a little bit longer than normal, I think we can do this. Y'all, y'all good if we get some real meat, we don't rush, and we still get out early? Is that okay? All right, I got at least one person okay with that. It sounds like that the, it's... Uh, Ms. Pamela, it sounds like the majority wants to stay late. No, that's not true. Let me, let me read the text, all right? Y'all's time is valuable, and we want to honor Jesus here, right, right here with this, that he'd be mine. Here's what the scripture says. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered, I can be encouraged by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel or in the good news. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I'll just tell you that the next time we get together, we'll talk about Epaphroditus, who was another concrete example, living human, at the time living human, that would have been a picture of what he was describing that they should be about. As we look at the context of it, and literally what he's describing, talking about not having like anybody else who's who, who just seemed to have um, other. They were others. They were Jesus minded first, and then others minded before they thought about themselves. He literally is referring back to what he gave them before he talked about Christ's example and his humility, because in the first part of chapter two, um, he literally says that you should think of others as more significant um, than yourselves and that you should be humble and not look to your, only your own interest. And so he's saying that Timothy is that guy, and this is how it looks. Now, there's a couple of things in here that I think are important. Number one is, uh, well, there's several things that are important, but one of those is that we get a picture into Paul's thought processes right here. And I don't know, I, like, I, I, don't think, I don't think we pick up on subtle cues often enough, perhaps maybe not this one. It's the first time I've kind of recognized it. But you've got in the Apostle Paul somebody that was, uh, he was imprisoned. I mean, he was under kind of house arrest, and he didn't know when they were going to let him go. He wanted to be let go, uh, but he didn't know exactly. They didn't give a timetable. It was a, it was a lot more of an uncertain time back then, and the authorities that were in charge, I mean, they didn't read. They, it was just different as far as how they went through the, process, the legal processes, and it wasn't always exactly fair. They certainly weren't obligated to tell you exactly how it was going to go. And so he's expressing, is it fair to say he's expressing some anxiety here? Like, he's hoping it's going to go well, but he didn't really know if it's going to go well. He said, well, that would be, you know, he, he was always perfect and always, I'm, I'm going to share with you how he actually did it. But, but he literally is telling us in the things that are uncertain and he doesn't know, instead of making promises that he doesn't know if he can keep, or just saying, hey, I'll tell him and I don't really know if it'll happen or not. He literally is going to be biblical. Like, he's going to, in how he approaches them and the information he gives them, say it in a way that actually honors God. Um, it would be equivalent of us today saying, hey, these are my plans. Unless God messes up my plans, these are, this is what I expect is going to happen. I don't really know for sure, so God's got, I'm, it, it, according to what God wants, this is what we're going to, like, I'm going to pivot if he makes me pivot, but this is the plan. Now, it's a struggle for us because we very seldom live in days, these days, where everything's certain, even when we think they are. And you've learned, we've learned, I've learned painful lessons that things don't always go exactly like you scripted them. I'm Fairly confident somebody's Father's Day is not going exactly like they scripted it. Everybody's Sunday does so, sooner or later. Most people's weeks do. Probably your year has. There may be other things I don't know about. Maybe there's worries about what things that are coming that you can't control. But the fact is we've all learned we can't control stuff. Guess what? The Apostle Paul couldn't control stuff. And so here's what he says twice in this little short segment. He says, first, I hope in the Lord Jesus. What is he saying? If my plan, like I plan to do what I don't know, he says, my, my hope in Christ and I'm hoping, in, like, my hope is in him, I, if, if, I want to be able to send Timothy to you. That's pretty strong thought, because what he's saying is, just like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, he's literally saying to us here, whatever happens tomorrow, my hope is in the Lord. It, 
when we say things out loud, we ought to actually start with the concept, like it wouldn't hurt, even if we have trouble believing it some days. I mean, you, ever, you, you know how you talk to yourself says a lot about what you really believe. And so he's saying, I trust God that I'm going to be able to send Timothy to you. I'm expecting to be able to, but I'm trusting the Lord. And the Lord can change. He can change what, like, he knows. Here's, what's, here's what Paul also would have known. And, but hang on a second. Let me show you some text here. Because he starts that way, and then by the time he gets, he gets done talking about Timothy, which we'll, we're going to look at the Timothy part, but he says, I hope, therefore, at the end, he says in verse 23, I hope, therefore, to send him to you just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So he says, I trust I'm going to send Timothy to you, and I trust I'm going to be able to come soon. It's not an accidental kind of thing. He's stating explicitly and showing us how he views life, that he always gives God freedom to act as God chooses and that he trusts God. That's in keeping with God's word, and it's a struggle that we have. Because we, in our humanity, and our very well-planned and organized and strategized um, and intentional humanity, the, the, the modern industrialized humanity, we think that we ought to be able to say what we know is going to happen tomorrow. And the fact of the matter is we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But we know who does. Because our faith instructs us that God knew from way before in fact, we've been learning, any of you who have gone through the Next Steps class know this, but we've been learning that God in Christ, when he created you new as his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10 said he got a list of things for you to do and to be about. I promise you he's going to let you be about anything he's put on your list. And so if it doesn't come about, it wasn't on the list. He wasn't caught off guard. This stuff was planned beforehand. So he's created you in Christ for some things to do, but beforehand, before the earth was created, he, like literally that's the, the lingo, he, he, prepared, he, he knew that was coming. So whatever catches you off guard later today, it didn't catch him off guard. So if the thing that you were planning and wanting to be about, the sickness came up, he knew. He said, well, my life's over and it can't be what it should be because it didn't, no, he knew, he knew. Does it make anybody else feel a little bit more comfortable? You say, well, God wouldn't let me, God would not be magnified in anything in me that's unpleasant. Like, he wouldn't let me go through something like that. You sure? How, how, how sure are you God's not going to, like, part of his plan is not to allow you to endure something that's unpleasant. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, you, you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. I mean, I mean you, you can't say it's this way and it's this way. No, no, no. The way that it is, is God knows. And we, as we grow in faith and step forward, what we want to be able to do, what we aspire to do on our best days at least, right, is to, to know the truth of the word where we say, God, I trust you. My hope is in you. I don't know that I understand what's happening. I, best I can tell, this is what's going to happen. But if it goes a different way, I know you've got a plan. And I think if we can get back to that refrain, Lord, whatever you do in my life, I want, I want people to see you clearly through it. And I trust you to strengthen me and to put the, 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 the will and then the strength, the, the mindset and then the ability to do the thing that you want me to be about. See, I'm just kind of encouraging you a little bit because it, 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 if we're not careful, we get hung up in this whole mindset that other folks can put assignments on certain days and say this one matters and this one doesn't, right? That a certain day, like... I know enough to know that Father's Days are extremely exciting for certain folks, and they're extremely hard for others. And the people that they're excited for is a really narrow group. Because it's exciting for those that still have one. It's exciting for those that want to be and are. It's exciting for those that have all the people in, like, in that, those pinnacle perfect moments. But there's huge volumes of that. That's not the case, right? And here's the deal. Like, every day, that that, every time that calendar comes around, do you know who puts the assignment on what that day's worth? If it's because we call it Father's Day, or we've taken, I, I've got to be careful not to go political here, but, you know, there's like three or four different things that this one day is actually, has been ascribed to as now, right? I'm not, it doesn't really matter what they make up tomorrow, but somebody made it up. And there's like, if, I don't know who gets the list, but there's some list somewhere that says this day's this, and this day's this, and this day's this, and we're celebrating that. You got anniversaries and birthdays, and there's all these holidays. Can I just tell you something? Here's the assignment the Bible gives to a day. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. This day. And I, me, you. What's your name? You know, and you don't, I'm not going to make you say it all at once. That's goofy. Uh, I thought about it. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we, I, us, we will rejoice and be glad in it. You know what he didn't say? Hey, this day, if it's the day that you want it to be, if it's always been a good day in that year in your life, then it can be a good day. But if it's not, then you got to know it's not going to be a good day. I'd like here to say, hey, God's word says this is his day. It's not their day. It's not, they don't get to assign and say it's a bad day, but you get to say, God, you said it's a good day. You said you have plans for me today. You, you apparently let me live and breathe, so you got some things for me to So show me what that is. Now, I'm going to trust you because the whole world's predicting it's going to be a bad day. Like, like they say, it's a beautiful sunny day in Florida. I hadn't actually looked at the weather forecast, but I, as far as I can see, it's going to be hot and it's going to be sunny, right? Is that a bad thing? I mean, are we supposed to say, oh, it's going to be sunny in Florida today. We live in the world's most beautiful beaches. It's horrible. Can you believe it? Well, yeah, it's going to be hot. Just wait a couple hours to go. I mean, you just want to have a bad day? You're going to convince yourself you don't have a bad day? You just want to replay that all the time? What's wrong with y'all, right? And, and if today wasn't great, what does the Bible say? The Bible says the new mercies, like in Lamentations, of all the sad letters for him to say it in in the Old Testament, new mercies are coming every morning. So if this day turned out not so great, even though he made it, and you still kind of somehow messed it up, right? He's giving you new mercies tomorrow. So here's what you don't want. Paul would have said, I trust God with tomorrow. Jesus said, tomorrow's got enough worries of its own. Or today's got enough worries of its own. But don't be worried about tomorrow. Live here. Before I get into the main part of it, here's the deal. The Apostle Paul said to us, I trust God with yesterday, with today, and with tomorrow. Right? Like that was his, I may not understand it, but I trust it. It's a basic tenet of the faith that we have to get right. Now, let me just kind of talk about Timothy for a minute, because I think this is incredibly important. He's given him to us as an, as an example. And I've seen some things about Timothy in the last, maybe in the last 24 hours, maybe in the last 12, because some things clicked this morning. But I've been, I've been looking at this all week. And it's fascinating to me when I, one of the things that I do, I don't know, they didn't teach me this in seminary, it's just something I do, but I kind of pour myself into the mind and heart of whoever the person is that I'm looking at. The names are there, and I just, I'm, I'm thinking, like, from trying to think from their perspective, what would that mean? And when I'm looking at Timothy's life, you know, there's some places I would have loved to have been in the Bible. I would have loved to have been there, and whatever that thing was that happened in Arabia where where after Paul was saved, he sat and, and got some instructions from Jesus. I think that would have been a really cool seminary education. I just think that would have been good. Uh, and there's some other moments that would have been really neat. Uh, these would have been scary moments to live with Paul through because it was a dangerous time, it was a difficult time, but Timothy did. Timothy was, Timothy was eyewitness. Timothy got to be there to see God do God-sized stuff through Paul, through great faithfulness, in moments where it wouldn't have been expected, he saw boldness and courageousness that we can't hardly fathom. And he, he literally walked through those days and got to help and, and be a part of it. That's a pretty cool deal. Now, he also did this at a time that we're going to find that, that, that Paul would have been an older fella. He would have been in the 60s to 70s. And 60s to 70s is not old, but whenever you've, when you've been shipwrecked and you've been, you've been beaten and stoned and, and like they threw rocks at you until they thought you were dead and they drug you outside the city, that's the, like the real story of what happened at Lystra. Uh, when they do all that, that's a little bit different than most just, just old football injur injuries. You know what I mean? And uh, they didn't have... Um, Dr. Frank, they, they, didn't, they didn't have physical therapists to come push you in the right spot, you know, and, and put you in agonist pain after surgery um, in the hopes that you feel better. I mean, I'm not calling you out or anything, but, like, they know how to, they know how to do stuff that makes you with that physical therapy better. But, in the, like, in their day, they didn't have any of that. And so we, we don't know if he had eyesight issues, Paul, the old Paul. Like, like we don't know if, I mean, some, I joke about him. It's something Austin and I play around with, but the whole idea he had a hitch in his giddy up, right? Like he, he, he might have limped a lot, and he probably, I mean, all these places, they didn't ride, they, it was a long walk, and they went a lot of places. He needed a young Timothy in his life, 
And he basically is going to tell him, look, I'm going to send you Timothy when I can send you Timothy, and he's the best I got, and he thinks about you guys the way I think about you, but I can't let, you, let him go right this second. Now, the image that you got with Timothy, you need to hear this. The concrete example is that he is a person that thinks like Paul is teaching because he's, he's learned it and absorbed it and really been taught it like a, a son to a, a father, a father to a son, really, in terms of mentoring. But the reality is that as he's, he's writing to him, he's telling him, look, um, he sees Jesus first. Let Jesus be magnified first. Then he's looking at how does, that, how does this mission that we got, how does that impact everybody else? Like, how can I, how can I put them first to make that happen? And then, then yourself. It's that joy, joy concept, right? Like, you've heard that across it before. And if we get that backwards, I mean, we counterintuitively somehow think that if we put ourselves first and then Jesus and others somewhere after that, then that's going to be the best way for us to be pleased. And it'll lead us to a place of fulfillment. And the answer is it doesn't. I mean, I promise you it doesn't. Some of you, you're living proof. I mean, because you're like, I, I, I put me first, but I'm still miserable. Like, I, I thought I got what I wanted, but now I'm there, and I don't, I, it isn't really that fulfilling. Paul says, Timothy is the example. Put Jesus first, others second. And he says he's the example that didn't, well, he didn't, he didn't constantly worry about what he was going to do. Now, with Timothy, you, you, you also see a couple of things at play. Number one is when you look at how he was saved, Timothy would have actually been saved before this church at Philippi began. It's really kind of cool because when you, when you go back and you look at it, you find, um, and, and I am going to go back and look at it, uh, you, you find there that uh, he accepted Christ, um, and then after, probably it happened on the a first missionary journey, right? Because when they came back to check on the churches, the people that were believers, that's when they, they identified Timothy as one that had, had accepted him. He probably was late teens, early 20s. Is the guess. I was like, that going that far back, that's pretty, pretty good to be able to guess that close. And it says that, um, it says, Paul also came to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple there uh, was named Timothy, and he was the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. So, um, so half Jew, half Greek. Um, he was well spoken of by the, so they really said lots of nice things about him. They were spoke, spoken of by Christians both at Lystra and Iconium, cities that were part of places that they had shared the gospel. Remember, Lystra's where he got stoned to death and Paul did and drug away. So that was an early image that Timothy would have had. So when Timothy's fixing to sign on to go serve with Paul, he knows what he's getting into. His family knows what he's getting into. Like they tried to kill Paul a bunch. And so when, they, when, when, when Paul says, hey, Timothy... I feel like you're, I think God's calling, you need to come go with me. Timothy's like, oh, yeah, I, yeah I, I think I'm supposed to do that too. It's because of a call of God on his life. But it was a big deal for his whole family, really, for him to make that decision. It was not a safe environment that he was getting into, and it didn't get any less safe. I mean, he's writing the letter out of that. Um, I think it's important for us as we, and I'm going to flip back right over real quick, and I'm going to have to be careful because I am going to get you out of here late if I don't, and I promised you something better than that, right? Um, so, so I, and I'm a man of my word. So it says in Philippians chapter 2, he says, I don't have anybody else like Timothy that will be genuinely concerned about your welfare. Now, Tim, he was saying, Timothy loves you like I love you. Can I give you some evidence of that? Like, it's in the Bible. That, like, the picture is there. Now, it doesn't say, well, he loves it. It does say that he went with them on the journey. He agreed to go on the journey, right? Acts 16. And then they saw, well, I, I'll go back to that in a minute. And then you've got, the, you've got the instruction that they're fixing to head off to Macedonia in Acts 16. They don't have all this on the screen, I don't think. But then in Acts chapter 16, verse 11, you know what you have? You have Lydia. And the Bible study in Philippi, down by the river, and a baptism. And I wonder if Timothy was there for the baptism. We got no reason to believe he wasn't, because Paul was there, and he was on the journey with Paul. So it's possible, likely, probably factual, that Timothy, as young as he was, still would have been there when his church was born. You think he cared about this church that he got to see from birth, and now is trying to encourage? And they're writing a letter to them, to encourage them along the way. They knew, when he says, we, uh, he, he, Peter had, or excuse me, Timothy has proven worth to you, they knew Timothy. They knew exactly who he was talking about, and I think they loved Timothy. Um, he also says here, um, 
He's genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interest. He apparently, I mean, Paul had some bad experiences with some others, and not those of Jesus Christ, like people that were wanting to make sure that their agenda was, was covered. And he says, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. Now, that's almost an understatement. And when I say that's almost an understatement, Philippians was a letter that was written first. We know that within a couple of years, this was the early 60s A.D., we know that within a couple of years, 1 Timothy would have been written. I'm not sure I fully had looked at it quite like this before today, but when you look at the beginning of these uh, of the, the letters that he wrote to Timothy, you, if you've been in church long, you know that Paul wrote the letter to Timothy to encourage a young preacher, blah, blah, blah. And that just rolls off the tongue, and it sounds great, and we move on to the next concept, right up until you make a note here that um, when he addresses Timothy in writing him, he talks about him as my child. I mean, it, it, all of a sudden, it's got a lot of emotion in it. And, and he says, uh, verse, chap, chapter 1 of First Timothy, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. That's a pretty strong uh, beginning point, right? And then not long after that, just a couple of years later, he's encouraging him with some stuff. And he says to Timothy, my beloved child. And he goes on to talk about a salvation experience. And he says to him, this is personal. He says, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Like he's remembering the moment the kid accepted Christ and where his faith came from and the call that's placed on his life. And he's reminding him of it, knowing these may be the last words that he gives him because still he's uncertain of some things about his own journey. And so I'm saying that to say to you, we could find a whole list of places where it's a pretty personal thing that's happening between Paul and between Timothy. Can I tell you that that's still supposed to be that way today? Ministry's supposed to be personal. It just is. It's supposed to be modeled for you. That's, this whole picture is a picture of Paul living for Timothy, who Timothy should be in Christ, and Timothy living in front of others is a living example. Like a, a contrast between what should be and what, what is when Christ is present and real. The way that scales up is that, honestly, if I'm, I'm not trying to put the pressure heavier than it should be, but if you've got a father role in your life or you've got an, a, a spiritual mentor person in your the people that you look to, maybe it's more than one. I've had more than one through the years. I mean, I've got a phenomenal father, no question about it, spiritually and uh, just as a man and in general, but there have been so many in my life. If I'm giving just a really quick example that's probably fresh and new to maybe nobody in the room, when I was in Jacksonville, and maybe some of these guys were watching, I don't know, I was introduced to some guys that pray like I've never seen guys pray before. Like these guys invited, they were, I was a young 24-year-old, these guys were deacons, they have been praying for years together, and they show up at like 6 or 7 a.m. Eastern time, which is like ungodly early back then. Um, and, and I mean, that was back when I was a little bit younger, um, like 20-something years younger. And so I'd sh I showed up because they challenged me, it's like, hey, would you come pray? We, we pray every Sunday. So I came in there getting ready, I was going like, okay, do we go to the altar? What do we, what do, we do right here? And they're laying flat on their faces. Like, these guys are sprawled out with everything but their lips on the carpet. And I'm like, they didn't teach me this in seminary. And, and what did I, I was challenged by some guys that were both, I mean, one was a Navy chief. The other one uh, was, was, I mean, he served his time in the Navy. These were guys that understood authority, and they were, uh, most of them, they were old enough to be my dad. And, and, and yet they looked at me as the authority because they understood all that. And yet here they were, these guys that, that had dec were decorated, and yet they were flat on their face trying to, Talk to a God that they feared and, and, and were humble before. I learned some stuff from what I saw and witnessed. Does that make sense? And hopefully you've had people like that in your life. And if you haven't, it's okay. We want to walk together with you. But my point is, it's not supposed to be, we need a real formal mentoring relationship and blah, blah, blah. That's hog. I don't know what book that's in, but that's not in this one. Like, that's not how you see it done. And so Paul and Timothy had this, this relationship. Now, let me, let me just tell you this. And this is where it's about to get real, real quick. Timothy wanted, and I think God called him to the relation. He did. He called him to, he, well, he spoke of the call in his life. This was not a lightweight commitment that Timothy took. Now, we look at it and we're like, oh, I would just love to be with Paul. Are you willing to pay what Timothy paid to be with Paul? Because it wasn't just a compassion and a love. He committed and I'm just going to tell you, if we had to ante up what he anted up, most of us, most of us would just say, oh, not me. I was going to be in, but now I'm out. You say, well, what do you mean? 
here's the crazy thing. Like, they had already had the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council. The Acts 15 Jerusalem Council said, if you are a Gentile and not a Jew, you do not any longer have to be uh, circumcised to be a part of the kingdom. You just have to accept Jesus. All this legalism stuff, you ain't got to do that no more. And if you don't know what that is, then, then, then go ask somebody else later. Don't, that, just hang with me, right? And so this men, well, I'm talking to men like we're men, and I'm going I'm to be as gentle as I can be and still be just kind of in your face. But gentlemen, I'm, I want you to hear me say this, because commitment matters. Timothy commits. Because Kit, Timothy, before Jesus, had no reason why he needed to be circumcised to go on a mission trip with Paul, except Paul asked him to. He said, hey, if you're going to go with me, you're going to have to go into some Jerusalem places. And while you've got no spiritual obligation to have to do it, well, you just can't. I, 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 need, you to be, I need you to do that if you're going to go with me. Some of y'all won't even get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You certainly ain't going to put the commitment and the flesh right on the table and say, all right, here it is. I'll, I'll, I'll tell me what the price is. I'll pay it. I mean, you're laughing. You should be because it's funny in an awkward kind of way. You know what I mean? Like, we're, on Sunday, we're like, oh, yeah, I want, I want, I'm going to be like that. And then not on Monday. I ain't want it that much. What time have I got to get up? <laughs> what do you really want me to do? You actually think I'm supposed to read my Bible? Really? So, like, like you want to be a spiritual champion, but you want to practice. You want to be a Christian. I mean, I'm not saying you don't, get a, you don't become a Christian by practicing. But if you want a godly family, what are you doing to have a godly family? Are you willing to pay the I mean, are you willing to be different to do it? And I'm just sitting here telling you, I don't think most people do. Um, Timothy experienced some really cool stuff. <laughs> Jokingly, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how many days after all that stuff, as a grown man in his late teens to early 20s, he, I mean, I had to look him out, not, nope, I ain't, nope, I ain't doing it. It says that after he did that, he went on his way and made the way to their cities and delivered to them. Like, hang on a second. Hang on a second. I don't think y'all caught this yet because I don't think I've said it right. He literally went through that procedure just so that pharisaical Jewish Christians that he was going to reach in the name of Jesus Christ that would look at him and say, let me get this straight, Timothy. Your daddy's Greek and your mama's Jewish. You ain't been circumcised and you ain't one of us. And Paul says, that's going to be a problem, Timothy. Unless you take care of this, they're not going to listen to you when you speak to them. And Timothy says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'll be all things to all men for the sake of some. Sign me up. I'm just telling you, y'all don't care that much about the loss to do that. And I'm not saying it meanly. I'm saying it with as pure a heart as I can tell you. We just don't care who knows Jesus and who doesn't that much. I mean, we, we won't give up meat or drink for the sake of some. And I had somebody ask me this, and it was really, it was really kind of funny. They're like, well, how did they know? Do they have a card? Or I said, I've met some Pharisees that would have said, you've got to show me. You've got to prove it. And somebody, listen to me, I know it sounds kind of crazy, like, how, hey, I just, I, it's Father's Day, men, I'm talking to you like men, okay? But, here, but here's the gig, here's the gig, we all know there's going to be that person, they live then and they live now, you tell them the truth, it's real, it's there in the flesh, I mean, the commitment's been made, it's a reality, and they're like, I don't believe it, unless you show me. It's crazy. Paul walked into the room with great confidence after Timothy took care of it. So that when they questioned him, what do you need to see to know? You think I've lost my mind. I'm telling you, we live in a real world. And in a real world, in a transparent place, when we want to share the gospel, we better be authentic. What I don't want to be, I don't want to just be going through the motions. Timothy wasn't going through the motions. So what did Timothy get to see because of that kind of commitment? It says they went and the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers and unity. You don't get the roll call. You don't get to see all the numbers. But you know that they went from church to church to church. They always went to the Jewish church places, the synagogues first. And they said, hey, this is what the council at Jerusalem has said about these Jews and these Gentiles that are accepting Christ. And they got to see the life change. And they got to see churches started. And they got to be a part of what God told them to be about. 
The letter at Thessalonica, the first one and the second one, you know what, whose name it has in there? It doesn't just say Paul. Paul and Timothy. Um, when, when you look at Colossians, the letter that, that, that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, you know who else was there? Probably talking about it as he was writing it. God giving him the, God giving him the word and him putting it down and then hearing the Bible. St- Timothy's commitment yielded something. It yielded opportunity that was unfathomable to be a part of something bigger than himself that had his eternal weight. It's a big deal. So what I think I would say to you is that if you want the kind of, if you want to be a concrete example of that, you got to be willing to make the commitment. Um, I can't tell you that every day I wake up, I reflect that kind of commitment. I can tell you I want to. I can tell you my intention is to press forward. My, my intention is to, to raise up, to see, to become a lot more like Timothy and to see more and more and more of those that would want joy in such a way that they put Jesus first and then others and then ourselves. Did you catch me on that just a little bit? Like, as you step forward, are you willing, are you willing, if you, if you want, if you want life to be different than it is, are you willing in Jesus' name to be committed that it would be different? I'm going to pray. I feel like now i got to get you out of here on time. I know I don't. Let me make a statement. Then I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. You saw and witnessed and I'm just going to affirm you, James, but I took guts. Grown man making a decision to be baptized um, as a statement of faith. In the second service, in the early service, I found another man that we baptized. We've been baptizing some men, women too. And I found him. I said, hey, can I tell you something? He knows the Bible pretty well. I said, hey. I said, we, we talked about you, you needing to get baptized because, you, you know, you're going to be teaching one day and all that kind of stuff because you, 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 you know the word. I said, pretty small commitment I asked out of you, wasn't it, compared to what I just talked about, right? Like, I just, I just asked you to be baptized. I didn't ask you to be circumcised. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool, right? And he grinned real big. He said, man, but it's dead on. I'm like, you're exactly right. It's dead on. Are you willing to commit? You committed, brother. You committed. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for today. I do pray that all the hearts that are hurting would be encouraged. I pray as believers in Jesus Christ, we could celebrate the space you've given us to live in in the name of Jesus Christ and the things that you want us to be about. Lord, our journeys are kind of, they're crooked. They're all crooked and messed up to some extent, never exactly what we've planned, but you are never caught off guard. And so we trust you today with what we don't know about tomorrow And even with what we think we know, we trust you with the past and where we may have failed things up until this time. And Lord, I'm not here today to condemn anybody. I'm just here today to read text and let hearts be uh, sharpened by your word, encouraged in some places and maybe convicted in some others. Lord, I pray there'd be others that would have this same conviction of a need for salvation through Jesus Christ that James has (laughs) described and received and that they also would make that same commitment. I pray, Father, that we also would be challenged to be committed this week to, do, to, to practice our Christianity, to practice in prayer, to practice our study in the Word and our relationship with you. We love you, Father. We trust you. We are so grateful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.